Good afternoon. I always introduce myself as the proud principal of Wedgwood Middle School, and today will be no different as I stand before you and those who continue to walk beside my staff as we take our journey to bring about a positive change for our Wedgwood students, families, and community members. So I am Diane Campbell, the very proud principal of Wedgwood Middle School and a very proud Columbus City Schools West High School graduate. I grew up in the Milo Grogan area, attending the former Lexington Elementary School. My grandparents were married 71 years, <laughs> owned a home in Milo Grogan on Peters Avenue that my mom and my family still own. Growing up in Milo Grogan, my siblings and I spent lots of time at the Recreation Center, Windsor Terrace Swimming Pool, and the Boys and Girls Club. After graduation, I returned to Columbus because my heart is here and my heart is in Columbus City Schools. I took my first teaching positions on the west side at West Mount Elementary School and Hiltonian Middle School. And soon after, I joined the coaching staff at my alma mater, West High School. 25 years later, believe it or not, I got the call to be the principal on the west side at Wedgwood Middle School. Now here we are. I watch as all hands, the amazing, amazing Wedgwood staff, students, parents, community, and the city of Columbus join together to bring life back into not only the Wedgwood community, but throughout the vulnerable areas of our city. When I was growing up, we had our share of gangs, gang violence, gang rivalry, and drugs but I truly believe because I could walk to the boys club, down the street to the recreation center, or two, three blocks over to the boys and girls club, that I avoided getting into the negativity. None of what I experienced as a kid amounts to what my students and my families are experiencing right now in the Wedgwood area. The increase in violence in Wedgwood has caused an additional traumatic experience for our young people and our families. Our families sometimes fear leaving their homes. The kids are in at night and can't play like we used to play as kids. And they fear walking around in the evenings for fear of gunshots or being robbed. During the school day, unfortunately, there have been times that we've had to evacuate the playground and go into the building because of dangerous activity in our area. Despite what is happening, our students, families, and community members continue to rise with the help of our community partners and the strong support of the City of Columbus. The City of Columbus Department of Neighborhoods have brought together our families, neighbors, and community members to discuss concerns and plan action steps to empower all Hilltop area residents and families. The City of Columbus has implemented the TAPS program, Teen and Police Academy, at Wedgwood, to reduce the social distance between law enforcement and the youth in our community. I proudly watched 21 of our middle school students graduate last week. They were mentored by police officers in conflict resolution, problem solving, with a focus on how to avoid drugs and violence, including bullying that we all experience every day. Over the course of the weeks, we saw a change in many of our students. We are grateful. We, our staff, our students, and our families are very grateful to the city's continued commitment in finding solutions to the violent crime in the Wedgwood area and including their efforts to provide resources for our community and for our youth so that they may have the opportunities like I did as a kid. It is my pleasure to introduce Mayor Andrew J. Ginther. Thank you, Mrs. Campbell. And now, uh, if you didn't know beforehand uh, why we are so lucky to have her as an extraordinary site-based leader uh, of one of our great middle schools in this community, uh, I was able to join Principal Campbell and her team for that TAPS graduation last week. And it was, it was pretty powerful. Uh, and a great partnership with the courts, the schools, the community, 
and our amazing young people and some of Columbus's finest who stepped up to help make that happen. I want to thank the, the Chief, the Division of Police, Dr. Shika Roberts and our Violent Crime Re Review Group, Director Carla Williams Scott, the Department of Neighborhoods, our Community Safety Advisory uh, Commission, uh, the Linden Recreation uh, Center team led by the wonderful and amazing Carlos Pace uh, and all of you who have joined us here today. When I listen to Principal Campbell, I am reminded once again of how violence profoundly impacts our young people, their families, and our neighborhoods. Almost six months ago, I unveiled the Comprehensive Neighborhood Safety Strategy. It came after weeks of conversations with people throughout our neighborhoods about their concerns, about what was working and what wasn't. As the name says, this strategy is comprehensive. We know that decreasing homicides in our city requires participation and leadership from all of our departments as well as from the community. Today, I want to update you on where each of our initiatives stand. First, we have seated the Columbus Community Safety Advisory Commission. As you may recall, this is a citizen-led commission to ensure the Columbus Division of Police meets our residents' expectations and serves and protects every person in every neighborhood throughout our city. It's composed of 17 members from diverse backgrounds, each who bring unique points of view to the table. The chair of the commission, Janet Jackson, was unable to join us here today, but the commission had its first meeting earlier this month. She has laid out an aggressive plan for the commissioners to focus on areas such as de-escalation, crisis intervention, and implicit bias training, use of force policies, diversity recruitment and retention, and early intervention and in officer wellness programs. They will, be they will also thoroughly review existing research of respected law enforcement and social justice experts. The goal for the commission is to make concrete, actionable recommendations to me by the end of the year to further strengthen our division of police. To help in that work, the city has put out a request for proposal to identify an objective independent consultant to support the commission's work. We expect to have a consultant on board by the end of June. Next, the Violent Crime Review Group under the direction of our health commissioner, Dr. Mashika Roberts, has been assembled and hard at work since December. Gun violence is a complex public health issue. It needs to be addressed in the same way we have addressed other public health challenges, such as infant mortality and opioid addiction. Through this internal working group, we are strengthening connections across city departments like public health, public safety, neighborhoods, and recreation and parks to increase communications and share data that will help us develop strategies to reduce violence. The Violent Crime Review Group's work will include a notification process similar to our opioid overdose surge notification process, which will rapidly notify member agencies when a homicide occurs in the pilot neighborhood to determine and provide an appropriate level of response within 48 hours to impacted residents and neighborhoods. This notification process will launch May 1st. A crime review process, process which will regularly and systematically examine homicide cases in the pilot neighborhood with a goal of making neighborhood specific crime intervention strategies and recommendations to reduce the number of homicides. We are beginning our work in the pilot neighborhood of Linden which was decided after an examination of 2015 to 2017 data from the Columbus Division of Police showing the levels of violent crime across patrol zones and precincts. The Linden area has, hist has historically high homicide rates. What we're able to implement here, we will eventually be able to scale 
to other neighborhoods. The CARE Coalition, which stands for Community, Action, Resilience, and Empowerment, also falls under the purview of the Department of Public Health. They continue to provide direct outreach to residents impacted by gun violence and other traumatic experiences to help connect them to services and to build resiliency. This includes door-to-door -door outreach to homes in Linden and the Hilltop, community debriefings for individuals experiencing trauma after traumatic events, mental wellness events for residents in the Hilltop and Linden to support healthy coping skills, provide education on resilience factors, and foster community togetherness. Community Remembrance Vigil for Families Who Lost Loved Ones to Violence in 2017, which was a deeply moving event we had just a few weeks ago at COSI. The CARE Coalition also is developing a community survey to better understand the experiences of trauma, trust, and resiliency in its neighborhoods of focus, Linden and the Hilltop. In November, I also announced the Neighborhood Crisis Response under the direction of Carla Williams Scott, our Director of Neighborhoods. The goal of this group is to coordinate physical deterrence to crime in neighborhoods that have experienced trauma. Principal Campbell, you'll be happy to know that this group uh, has already begun its work with a focus on the Wedgwood neighborhood by surveying and replacing burnt out street lights. But that's just the beginning. Plans for summer activities, as Mrs. Campbell and I were just discussing, like soccer and summer loss learning and English as a second language classes are all in the works for Wedgwood. Rather than solely focus on grade school, we want to focus on the whole family, the whole neighborhood. And with amazing partners like Mrs. Campbell and her team, we know we can make a difference in the Wedgwood community and others in this city. I'm also happy to announce that we have created a position within the Department of Neighborhoods that coordinates with the different departments, the, public, the Department of Public Health, on non-police efforts of reducing violent crime. I am equally pleased to announce that Emerald Hernandez accepted that position, the challenge of this position, moving from my office to this very important role. Emerald, will you please stand? Thanks for your leadership and your commitment. The Neighborhood Safety Committee is also set to have its first meeting later this week. This group will be led by our community liaison officers made up of Block Watch volunteers and community leaders to review information from the Violent Crime Review Group and give real-time feedback on neighborhood intervention strategies with our neighbors and Block Watch captains who are on the front lines. Finally, our Safe Neighborhoods program is finalizing its next session. This group's work is deterrence for potential repeat young uh, offenders and works in conjunction with the Franklin County Court of Common Pleas. The proliferation of guns remains a reason for the increase in homicides in this community and in communities around the state and country. I'm working closely with the city attorney and the council president to pass local legislation that will close the gap between state and federal weapons laws, protect all victims of domestic violence, and keep dangerous weapons out of neighborhoods. I'm encouraged by Governor's case, Governor Kasich's proposal to reduce gun violence, including his executive order to strengthening background checks to keep weapons out of the hands of people who should not have them, and his opposition to the Stand Your Ground bill that will make neighborhoods less safe. Finally, I want to remind everyone of the city's commitment to expand our police force comprehensive approach from the entire community and the city. Our first class of 50 new recruits will graduate in June, the other in December. 
for a total of 100 new police officers coming to serve neighborhoods this year alone, the most we have hired in five years. Now I would like to offer the podium and introduce our Chief of Police, Chief Kim Jacobs, to give you a, free, a few updates uh, from CPD. Chief. Thank you very much, Mayor, and I appreciate your support. Uh, we will use our new officers wisely and effectively. Um, one of the smallest numbers that we have to deal with and respond to, but probably the most intensely felt is our homicide numbers. So it's a very low number when you think of the hundreds of thousands of calls for service that we get, but it's one of the most inten intensely felt, not just by the family and and the relatives and friends that are grieving, but by the entire neighborhood and by the entire city. Homicides have an actual financial impact on cities, and that's something that, that we take into consideration across the board for all of these reasons why it's important for us to solve homicides as fast as we can, to bring some resolution, first of all, to the family, but also to get that person responsible off the street. We want them to be gone so that they cannot do more harm to our citizens. So one of the things that we've been working on is trying to solve more of our homicides, and we've seen some progress in that regard. As of February um, 1st, I believe, we had 70 or 62 of our cases solved for, 19, for 2017 and 79 suspects. Just two months later, we now have 74 cases solved and 93 suspects identified. So that's a pretty good increase in just a couple of months for all of our 2017 homicides. And fortunately, I hope it's fortunately, although there's 31 families that have been affected so far this year, uh, we are running behind last year's numbers at the same time. So we'll continue to do that. A couple of the strategies that we implemented, not just uh, in, in our efforts to solve the cases, but to add more people and time to solving these cases. We've got a pilot program going on with the coroner's, coroner's office, which we really appreciate um, them taking the lead here. They, they're required to do an investigation if a death occurs, not at the hospital, but at home or someplace away from a, a doctor's care. And um, we've always sent our detectives out, our homicide detectives out, to investigate those deaths. They're called DOAs, death on arrival when we get there. Um, we've always sent detectives to investigate, and then the coroner's office also investigates. Well, we believe that was duplicative and redundant, so we're going to do a 90-day uh, pilot program, which we're already into. And um, so one of my detectives got a call and says, hey, there's a DOA that happened, and he started to think, oh, you know, five hours for sure, or I'm going to have to be away from my desk. And then he remembered, no, the coroner's handling this right now. And so that's five hours that he has to devote to the homicide cases that is, are, are on his desk rather than leaving that desk to investigate this DOA. We still have any, you know, we'll call the detectives out if there's any suspicious activity around that particular death, but people just sometimes, you know, die, expire at home, and um, so the coroner's office is going to help us out by making our detectives have more time. Another thing that we've also implemented is uh, we've got a, a unit of officers called our cold case detectives that are assigned homicides that haven't been solved in some period of time. So they are now also being assigned to work on uh, aggravated assaults shootings that might have occurred without a fatality, they'll go out and investigate those instead of sending our homicide detectives on first shift. We don't have a squad for assault on first shift, so they are going to be also looking into those shootings that happen on first shift and giving more time to our homicide detectives. So we believe a lot of these different strategies will go back to working on those, that very small number, but very intensely felt, uh, felt um, number of homicides that occur in our city. So we'll continue to closely work on that. And Principal Campbell, I believe we met uh, just last year out on the west side and uh, talked. Um, one of the things that you said was the, the type of violent crime that's going on. And I would just like to remind everyone that um, we track our violent crime numbers. And if you look at our charts, it looks like our numbers are down. But we do know that there's a number of unreported crimes that do occur. And I would just continue to encourage people to call in about the violent crimes that happen. We need to know about those. We can't investigate them if we don't know. 
So while it might feel like you know, you're calling us all the time, just call us all the time if you have to. People need to know, the mayor needs to know, city council needs to know that these things are occurring and we have to deal with them. So please don't hesitate to call in crimes. Another new initiative that I'm very proud of that we're doing um, is just adding another layer of customer service to what we are already doing. And that is we've created a system where officers can now send a text message to a mobile phone for our callers at the end of a call. call it, close the call. A lot of officers spend time at the end of the call face-to-face -face, personally wrapping up the call. You know, you call us about something, we're, we're going to go back and inform you what happened. Sometimes that's not always possible or you might have already left your, your site. It might be somebody that's just driving down the freeway that saw an accident and called it in. So now our officers can send a text message from their mobile computer in their cruiser to tell our caller, this is what happened, thank you for calling. We also now are implementing our, um, our requirements to inform people of their victims' rights. A uh, constitutional amendment was just passed called Marcy's Law. And so we can send um, that information via text message so that people can just read all of their rights right on their phone now as well. So we believe that that um, new customer service might provide some answers to people that wonder whether or not we actually showed up. I'll give you an instance. I was out riding on New Year's or Christmas Eve, and we got a call at 9 o'clock about an ATV riding through the front yards of a number of homes. We didn't get dispatched until 11 o'clock at night because it was changeover, short staff, holiday, all that kind of thing going into it. All the lights were off at the house where the caller lived. We sent him a text message and said, we were here. We saw the, the tire prints in the snow. We don't see any current activity, but call us back if you'd see it. So that way, at least they know that we were there and didn't have to guess and follow up by themselves. So we'll be continuing to use that and to continue to grow that in a lot of different ways. Another thing that everybody's probably very interested in is our Safe Streets Initiative, part of the neighborhood strategies. So last year, we tried it out here in Linden and with great success. Um, a lot of personal contact by the officers, going to community meetings, engaging with people on the streets. We're going to continue that this year in Linden, but we're also expanding it now to the south side. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> I agree. So we're going to expand it to the south side, and we're also going to expand it to the hilltop area. And so there'll be three teams this year instead of just the one team. So one of the things that the principal mentioned is this community policing idea, right? It's all of us together. It's not just us. It's not just community members. It's all of us together. So I'm going to ask the people in Linden, Hilltop, and the South Side, when they see these officers out there on bikes, they'll be in uniforms, riding around, say, hey, you know, what's going on in your neighborhood? Attend some of the meetings that might be going on, block watches, community meetings, area commission meetings, whatever it might be. The officers will be there, and guess what? They're going to have priority for 311 calls. So if you tell them about the trash lane in the alley, that particular team, they've got priority now. So they're going to call that in, and then hopefully within a couple of days, we'll get something fixed up re with regard to picking up the trash or taking care of some other quality of life issue. So those three teams will be out there. First two, Linden and the South Side, will start May 1st. And they will hang around the schools until the end of school year, a little bit. And then they'll also be there on the hilltop starting in May 15th or so. So three teams, and um, they will have business cards to hand out. So use that information. If you get a business card, use that information to email or call somebody and say, hey, I know somebody's doing something over here. You can do that anonymously. You can do it publicly, however you want. But we're going to work with you. Those teams will have the time. They're not going to be taking calls for service and going, you know, taking reports and all that kind of stuff. They're going to be answering and be responsive to community requests. So great idea that we're going to expand into more areas this year. And we appreciate the support for our staffing with some of the extra overtime money that it will take to do those extra jobs. Um, the last thing I wanted to bring up was just um, that we've got some great success already with our new and expanded recruiting unit. We, we had a change of personnel. The uh, mayor gave us a, a pretty, pretty strong uh, directive, and he said that he wants to double our diversity. It's a great goal. 
So we had to do something different. You can't do the same thing over and over again and expect different results, right? And they call that insanity. So we're, we're doing something different. We've added two more officers, so a total of four officers and one sergeant, all new personnel who have a burning desire to recruit more diversity into our division of police. And they're already at it. One of the things that a lot of police officers will tell you is that one of the biggest hooks for them, and it certainly was for me, back in 1979, I went on a police ride along before I got hired and I said, yeah, this is what I wanna do for the rest of my life. A lot of officers had that same experience. So last year, we only had a few people that we encouraged to do a ride along. The new recruiting unit has already encouraged 123 people to go on a police ride along in just three months. That's a big difference maker. And it's not just for people that want to be a police officer. Understand that all of you, all of you may go on a ride along with a police officer to see what it's like from that side of the windshield and when it's standing in their shoes. And I encourage that all the time. And guess what? We're open 24 seven, 365, and we can take you at any time of the day. So uh, just let us know if you want to go on a ride along and, and, and really find out what it's all about and or encourage, encourage people to do that if they're at all interested in a career with the Division of Police. So thank you very much. Mayor, thank you. Thanks, Chief. Thank you, Chief, for all of uh, the great work and partnership uh, with the community and the city in furthering uh, this initiative and want to make mention of uh, Director Pettis, our safety director, uh, and uh, Lyndon alum, who uh, is helping to lead the way on this uh, safety strategy, Director. We're grateful uh, for everything you're doing. I don't know about you, but I got a little fired up, uh, and I'm committed to a ride along for this summer, and I hope everybody in this room will commit to do a ride along as well. Uh, it's, all, it's something each uh, one of us can do and can participate in to better understand law enforcement, but also share our perspectives uh, as citizens with law enforcement about what we're seeing and hearing uh, to help us bridge that gap and divide uh, and bring uh, our law enforcement community and our neighborhoods closer together. I want to reiterate what the chief told us uh, about the continued work on the 2017 uh, homicides. I know there's a tendency to simply start a new count with a new year, but we cannot forget that each of these homicide victims was a son or a daughter, a brother or a sister, a mom or a dad, a neighbor, a friend. Their families deserve closure and accountability. Next, I would like to invite the Director of Recreation and Parks to the podium to talk to us about our focus on young people, job readiness, and the service of families in our community. Please welcome Director Tony Collins. Mayor, thank you. Thank you for your support and for your leadership. In my role as Recreation and Parks Director, I often hear the stories of how the power of impact of our of nature of creativity or the health and wellness initiatives that we have going on in our community centers or in our parks every day and most a lot of those stories not most but a lot of those stories are told by people like me who started their work path their their career their job in a recreation setting whether it's here at a community recreation center like Linden or at a YMCA or a Boys and Girls Club somewhere in the community. I get to hear about that power and impact and the, the change it affected in them. We know that providing youth employment and job readiness programs help our young people show improvements in social skills, community engagement, job preparedness, and even academic aspirations. Mayor Ginther, our city council, and our Columbus neighborhood leaders recognize that youth employment and job readiness plays a role in our comprehensive neighborhood safety strategy. And so we've shown that through investment in the program. In 2017, Recreation and Parks employed over 700 young people, 15 to 24. We paid out $1.3 million in salaries to those young people. We know that it's not just a salary to them, it's not just a paycheck, 
It's a life-changing opportunity for those young people in our community centers and in our parks. We'll continue that effort in 2018. We have that same amount budgeted through our community centers and our, and our parks, and that information, I'll talk a little bit about and where you can find information on those positions. But I want to talk to you about an additional effort that we started in 2017 when Mayor Ginther came to us and asked us to do more. We started a pilot program, a recreation and parks program through our apps, Applications for Purpose, Pride, and Success, a nine-week job readiness program that provided training, mentorship, and job placement for 15 to 23-year-olds in our recreation and parks department. This spring, our department took that program even farther. We partnered with Franklin County and were able to offer that, that program to 40 more young people, 15 to 24, but this time, young people who had experienced some trouble in their, and, and, and had a, a misdemeanor that they had to deal with, a, a barrier for employment sometimes. So we've been welcoming them into our department, putting them through, through this job training program, and giving them an opportunity as well. Well, I'm here to tell you today that in collaboration with Workforce Development and with the support of Mayor Ginther, CRPD is going to grow that program in 2018, and we've already begun accepting applications for an additional 100 young people for our, our Recreation and Parks Department uh, for the Workforce Development Program in 2018. The teens will be uh, young adults through 15 to 23 years of age that live or attend and school in one of our opportunity neighborhoods. Uh, we, we partner and make sure that we're, we're working alongside with our friends with Celebrate One. I see some of our friends from the Connector Corps here. Uh, every Tuesday, these participants will receive training from dynamic youth instructors and counselors in uh, cultural awareness, digital citizenship, financial literacy, among other professional development topics. The rest of the week, the participants will work in our various city recreation and parks department functions and work teams. Participants will work between 20 and 25 hours a week, making around $10 an hour, uh, and, and have an opportunity to not just um, be trained in a specific area, but also have a CPR and first aid training, as well as financial literacy training. Those trainings, by the way, are part of the certification towards the 12 points that they need towards graduation. So that's a, a tie-in this year. You can, you can see that this isn't just about a paying job, it's much more. It's, this is about equipping our young people with lifelong lessons and help them succeed for the future. The information on this, this program, as well as our traditional seasonal part-time employment programs, our seasonal part-time programs is available at Columbus.gov with our normal job sites, but the, the job training program, if you have young people who are interested, you'd like to refer to them, go to columbus.gov backslash schools out, because it's a part of our schools out initiative that Mayor Ginther has been leading and helping make sure that we have a place for all of our young people when they're not in schools. Thank you for allowing Recreation and Parks to be part of the solution. We look forward to continue to work with our community and uh, having an opportunity for our young people. Thanks. Thank you, Director Collins, to you and, and to your team and all of your work to help us make this a comprehensive uh, neighborhood safety strategy that is going to focus on results uh, for the people of our neighborhoods, uh, our young people, uh, our seniors, uh, and families throughout the community. Um, very fortunate to have with us today uh, a dear friend and a partner on so much of this work. Uh, he wears the hat. He wears many hats. Uh, today, I guess he'll be wearing the hat of state representative and minister. Uh, but please welcome uh, Representative uh, Herschel Craig, who's going to close us out in prayer. Representative. Thank you. Appreciate you. If you will do just something for me, would you stand on your feet and honor our mayor with applause today? I do that because all of this requires leadership, and he certainly demonstrates leadership. This is a very difficult issue, and so, Mayor, thank you so much for your leadership. And if you will do something else for me, will you just grab your neighbor by the hand, if you will do that? Dear Lord, you are our refuge and our strength. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord abides forever. 
God, these are tough issues. These are tough times. But God, we are not devoid of hope. And so today we thank you. We thank you for the leadership of our mayor. We thank you, God, for the leadership of our police chief and our recreation and parks director and our educators and all that are assembled in this room. But we grab the hand of our neighbor because this requires collaboration. And this requires a, a comprehensive approach for all of us to get engaged. Because when one life is lost, it affects all of our community. It is our family, it is our children, it is our neighbor, it is a father, it is a daughter. And so God, would you just lead us today, all that we will be engaged in, to really help all of our communities in the city of Columbus. We can do this because we're relying on you. God, wear your feet in your hands, and God, would you strengthen our resolve that not one person in our community can fall with, with violence. Help us all in this effort. And God, as we leave this place, but never from your presence, keep us all in your loving care. And everybody said, amen.